Well, it's Leonard McEwen again, and today we're going to talk about grief in the workplace. Normally, we'd have a pretty upbeat introduction to this, but Virginia isn't with me today. Unfortunately, she had uh, other activities that she needed to attend to, so it's just me by myself. I've chosen a topic that's pretty important to me. A good portion of my practice deals with working with organizations where there has either been a death in the workplace or a death that has affected the workplace because it has been the death of an employee or someone close to an employee that is affecting the whole team. It's been my experience over the last 20 years that many people will just sort of blow this off and say, you know, it's just a death in the workplace. You know, you should be able to get over it. Well, I think there are a couple of key points that we need to remember. The first one is that we're often closer to people that we work with than we are to people at home. We spend more time with people in wor at work than we do at with people at home. And that makes a huge difference in our attachment. The quality of attachment and the intensity of the attachment. And so it's my belief that the entire workplace is affected by the grief experienced by any one member. This I often call grief by association. So what does that mean to you? Well, it means that if you're working in a workplace and somebody has experienced a loss, just by watching and interacting with that person, you may feel the same feelings as the griever. You know, those are many of the typical feelings of shock, sadness, anger, the feeling of helplessness, powerlessness in terms of how you can be of help to the person who is experiencing grief. And that uncomfortable feeling in dealing with your feelings and those of the griever. In fact, this for me is one of the paramount things that uh, uh, affects the workplace and often affects people in the workplace who are key to helping a person get over grief and loss. And that is, they become afraid of the intense emotions associated with grief and loss. So there are two things that I'd like people to remember when dealing with grief and loss in the workplace. The first one is be there as a friend. That may sound straightforward, but many people go out of their way to avoid the griever. Try not to do that. Instead, go out of your way to visit with them and be there for the long haul. Grief isn't something that normally takes two or three days. In fact, my experience is that it may take two or three weeks for people to lose that numbness, that feeling of uh, absolute shock that occurs when a person is in grief. And the second point is listen to the person. Encourage that person to talk about their feelings. But for yourself, make sure that you set good boundaries. One of the key points I wanted to mention about talking about their feelings is try and get them to talk about their feelings. But if it's a, a grief the loss of somebody where they have witnessed the loss or their memory or their imagination about the death of the individual involves uh, horrific graphics, try and get them not to talk about those images. One of the things that I've come to appreciate is that it, it's, it's a bit of a an overstatement, but the brain really can't tell the difference between reality and imagination. And so if they begin to talk about what they saw or what they imagined, um, it will re-trigger them 
into the instant they got the bad news. And so be aware that talking about their feelings, how they're reacting to the event, um, is an important point, an important way to help them. But having them tell about the detail of the death itself is not going to help them and may set you up for vicarious trauma. So those are the key things that we can do for the individual who's grieving. One other key point that I like to mention is that as much as therapists would like to think that we're important in the recovery process, the truth of the matter is we're not. The most important thing that you can do is listen. And you don't need to be a professional to do that. Again, you just need to have good boundaries to protect yourself so that you can continue to be of help. So let's take a moment now and take a look at how grief affects the workplace. Well, it has a profound effect on the workplace. One of the things that I've noticed and has become apparent because of calls that I've been asked to go on is that employees who experience grief can't concentrate and tend to make bad decisions. That's really important when we couple it with the fact that we do most of our grief work when we drive, and so that makes us distracted drivers. A personal story, I got some bad news just before Christmas a while back. I was in an office in downtown. I left the office, went to my truck, got in my truck, and headed back to my next appointment and instantly drove through a red light because I was focused on what had happened in the meeting. I was a distracted driver grieving an event that occurred in the office. So, concentration and making bad decisions are one of the features you may notice within an organization that have an employee or employees who are demonstrating grief. If you have supervisors who are experiencing a, uh, a loss, grieving the loss of somebody or demonstrating mourning, it may impact all people that they supervise. All people that they supervise. And so taking good care of that person and in fact their teams is going to be important if you're going to look at the health of the organization long term. Another effect of grief in the workplace, of course, is unsafe work behaviors. Well, we've already talked about distracted driving, but increased error rates, etc., uh, are a fact of life after grief and loss. So what can corporations do? Well, my belief is they can offer bereavement leave. Normally, bereavement leave these days is three days off for the immediate family. I'm not sure that that's enough. I know after the, the death of my mother, a person who I loved dearly, I was ineffective for well over a month. If you happen to be a counselor who has suffered a loss, please remember this because your ability to stay present for your clients may be significantly diminished. I can be remember being asked to lead a team going into a natural disaster to help the residents who had evacuated and being told that one of my team members had just lost their house in the disaster, and I was asked whether I thought that was all right. Well, I didn't. I thought the person needed 
our assistance as opposed to expecting him to provide assistance to others. Know what your corporate culture is. I respond to a great number of deaths in the workplace, and one of the facts that I find fascinating is that most organizations do not have a policy or procedure related to a death in the workplace or the death of an employee. And so there is really no corporate culture, and when I arrive on site, they're basically making it up as they go along. A part of that culture may be the use of workplace counseling, an employee assistance program. And I I have to say I'm a bit biased here. I believe that the use of a debriefing and de, or a defusing and debriefing process subsequent to a death is really important in terms of the ongoing health of an organization and the well-being of its employees. You might want to look at workplace education. <clears throat> that would be education about the corporate culture of compassion. The corporate culture of compassion could be simple things like what I call the tuna casserole policy. When somebody dies, support the family by sending gifts of food. I think that's a really important step and is definitely a part of North American culture and has been around forever. There are even foods that are named because of their common use for that. Things like funeral potatoes. Provide stress relief. Simple things. Anything that will help the bereaved change their decor. One of the components of that for me is always reducing the lighting, getting rid of the overheads if you can, softening the colors if they happen to be harsh, and doing your best for noise control. Seeing if the corporate culture allows for flexibility Flexibility in work schedules or in duty assignments, in job sharing and in telecommuting. I recently fi finished working with an organization that lost two employees in a tragic situation. And although I believe it's important that people go back to work, I was under no illusions about what this group was doing or was capable of doing. And so duty assignments were simply take a look at safety, see what needed to be done in order to have people recertify in safety areas that may have come close to lapsing. Take time to meet with your friends in the coffee room and talk about your feelings about the incident, about the person who, or the people in this case, who are missing now, and how they'll be missed. Another part of corporate culture may be looking at creative programs. Many organizations I've worked with have made decisions to hold memorial services. That's been especially important for people in... Uh, areas where once there's a, a death and it's a safety concern and uh, occupational health has put a stop work order in, that many of the employers will send their employees home, which takes away their opportunity to talk to each other about the importance of the person who has died. I have been with companies where Creatively, they have kept all employees together and had them work on areas that were unaffected by the stop work order. Things like recertifying for all 
certificates that were necessary to accomplish the work, or perhaps doing volunteer work in the community, or planning fundraisers to support the family or families of those people who had died. So as we move ahead on this, there becomes, it becomes apparent that there are some general principles that any sort of corporate culture might want to embrace in order to support employees and, in fact, the community. One is acknowledging that the workplace is a grieving place. In saying that, we know that the impact is physical, emotional, cognitive, social, and spiritual. And if we can, a corporate policy might embrace all of those. Remembering that you cannot separate you from grief or from your job. We need to overcome some of the misconceptions about grief and mourning. These are really not helpful. Ellen Wolfelt, uh, one of the men I hold in really high regard because of his work in this area, is, is um, very helpful as a resource if this is an area you're concerned about. Misconceptions about being strong and carrying on. I've worked on a number of natural disasters where people have lost homes. And the campaigns after the losses have been be strong, or Fort McMurray strong. But one of the things that happens to many of the folks in Fort McMurray or anywhere who have suffered loss is that they aren't feeling strong. And so they're stigmatized by the thing that is supposed to empower them. As a result of that, they don't seek help. They don't seek somebody to listen to the story. Another misconception is tears are a sign of weakness. I think not. Or that people need to get over their grief. I hear this so often. It's simply not true. Some of the current literature tells us that we experience grief for three to five years in its acute phase, and then for the rest of our life. I know that I will grieve the deaths of my father and my mother, my mentor, and others that have been important in my life until the day I die. The intensity of my grief remains the same. My coping strategies have become more efficient, and so it doesn't have such huge impact on my functioning. The workplace is a, a poor place to express sadness. Well, that denies opportunities for healing for those people who have experienced loss. Death is not something that we talk about, especially at work. Well, as we become a death-avoidant culture, that's becoming more and more true. Unfortunately, I'm not sure that being a death-avoidant culture is helping us much. Just a quick story. I attended the funeral of a friend of mine. We'd been friends for over 50 years. She was an incredibly important person in my life. She was well known, and when I attended the church where the service was being held, I noticed that there was no casket. There was no urn. Everything was upbeat. There was no sadness, at least none that people were going to display. And when I left the church, I met with a group of people that shared their, shared my love for this, this person, this woman. And the one thing that we had in common was that we were all angry about the service 
because we didn't have an opportunity to say goodbye. When someone is grieving, the best thing to do is to leave them alone. Unfortunately, I think that that talks about our weakness, our fear of being next to intense emotions. The worst thing that we can do is actually leave them alone. We need to give them an opportunity to tell the story of the person who has died and how important they were in their lives. This one I love, time heals all wounds. Well, time doesn't heal all wounds. That is a misconception. And when we make a decision to move on, we will begin finding some relief in our grief, but we need to make that decision. And finally, you can't help somebody else with their grief. Well, you can by listening, and that's key. Our fears, we may cause guilt, shame, and other feelings, negative feelings, when we back away from the griever. Well, we usually back away, in my opinion, because we don't know how to handle the intense emotions and they take energy. And unless our self-care is at the top, we won't have the energy to do the work. It's important that we recognize that grief is a normal and necessary experience. In fact, if we go back and look at the symptoms associated with grief and loss and trace their origins back, many of them are symptoms that our body uses to protect us from bad news. In reading about grief and loss, one might want to look at the clock study, Changing Lives of Older Citizens by, by um, Ness and Workman and others and their discussion within that edited book about how these symptoms allowed man to survive in the past. So in taking more from Alan Wolfelt's work, we have to remember that there's the difference between grief and mourning, that grief are internal thoughts and feelings that we have when somebody dies and that mourning is our outward expression of grief and that we have to mourn if we're going to integrate the loss into our lives. And we do that by a number of things. First of all, by telling the story and by telling the story and by telling the story. And did I say by telling the story? Because the story often has to be told over and over and over again. It's a vital part of healing. Because it helps mourners to acknowledge the reality of the death. Acknowledge the reality of the death. A part of that too, a part of telling the story, in my opinion, is the importance of the funeral or some form of memorial, often in the workplace, especially a workplace that has suffered a loss on site and uh, occupational health and safety has put in a stop work order and the employer has sent everyone home. We've diminished the opportunity for people to sit and talk and tell the story. Fortunately, there are opportunities with new technology to use the internet to broadcast the funerals to others who may be cities, provinces, or even countries away from the actual service, and yet they're able to witness it and participate in that healing. We really need to recognize the emotions of grief shock and numbness, disorganization and confusion, anxiety and fear, anger, blame, resentment, guilt, regret, sadness, and relief. We also need to know the physical symptoms, sleep disruption, low energy, 
muscle aches and pains, shortness of breath, tightness in throat or chest, and just a comment about tightness in the chest. If you're getting chest pains after the death of somebody important in your life, especially within the first two or three weeks, but really at any time, go and see a doctor. Research has tell, told us that the likelihood of you having a heart-related incident has gone up and uh, will stay higher for a period of time. Digestive problems, heart palpitations, nausea, headaches, changes in appetite, weight gain or weight loss, having to remember that we need energy to, to do grief work and so making sure that employees have access to good nutrition is important. Remember our comments about the gifts of food? Cognitive effects, focus and concentration are compromised. My story about driving through the red light, memory is compromised. Decision-making often suffers. Perseveration on the death often occurs. <clears throat> Pardon me. I just want to jump back to decision-making for a moment because one of the things that I've had reported to me when I've done this work in hospitals is that often the error rate with medication goes up and so special precautions have to be put in place. Because we're talking about the workplace, we need to talk about the social effects. It's important that we acknowledge that the act of supporting others who are grieving is a draining task. And our self-care is important. Family and friends often avoid mourners. Remember our comments about intense emotions and how people avoid them. We also have to remember there is both instrumental and intuitive forms of grief. Just a short story. Many years ago, I had a couple come to see me. And they came into my office, and as I usually do, I said to them, what brings you in? How can I be of help? And the wife said, we've lost our daughter to cancer, and my husband is not showing any signs of grief or loss. And she went on for the next half hour to tell me about how she'd gathered together family and friends and community to talk about her daughter and how important it, that her daughter was in their lives. And at the end of that period, at the end of her discussion, she stopped. And I said to the husband, you've heard that your wife is concerned that you're not showing any signs of grief and loss. And he said, oh, but I am. And I said, can you tell us how? And he said, well, every morning I get up and I pull on my coveralls and I go out and I start the tractor and I go to the back 40 and I pick rocks and pull stumps and plow the field. He was a, This was a farm couple. And I'm getting that area ready to plant next year. And I sat back and it, it took me a moment to realize what was going on. My family comes from a farming background. If you go to Dauphin, Manitoba and ask where the McEwen homestead is, many people will be able to point you in the direction of the old homestead. But our family hasn't lived there for 70 years. What this farmer was doing was preparing the land and putting it to productive use, just as my grandparents did, so that it would carry the name of his daughter. That was his monument for her. So why is that important to us in this discussion of grief in the workplace? It's important because it will split the, f the workplace just as it was splitting the family if we don't respect that everybody does grief differently. The husband was demonstrating instrumental grief, going back to work, creating the monument. The wife, intuitive grief, talking about her loss and how important the person who had died was.
other social effects, like doing nothing, which is perhaps our absolute worst alternative in grief and loss. We have to watch for the mourners that isolate themselves. Some isolation is okay because you need to process. Just as the farmer would be processing as he worked the field, others need perhaps to sit quietly at their desk or in a, a soft room that the company may have available. But you have to be really careful that all emotional support is not cut off. We have to look at the spiritual effects too. Many mourners wrestle with beliefs about life and death. More support, more satisfaction in life and work. Many of these things become topics of conversation or thought and challenge after the death of someone in the workplace. I'm going to borrow from Alan Wolfelt again and look at the reconciliation needs because they apply to the corporation as well as the individual. The corporation needs to acknowledge the reality of the death. This may take weeks or months to do because many people may try and avoid the reality of the death. Many may be confused and need to replay the death. But in acknowledging the reality of the death, perhaps the corporate philosophy or policy might allow for some memorial, some monument to be placed I've had the privilege of working with organizations where after the death of one or two employees, they've created a, a memorial wall. Each plaque offering the name and the role of the individual who has died and their dates. We have to embrace the pain Repressing it or denying it, which is often corporate culture, is not helpful. However, we may need to dose ourselves, and Ellen Wolfelt speaks of dosing. I like to refer to it as eating the elephant, where the pain of the loss may be overwhelming, and we just take it and deal with it a little bite at a time. The corporation can help by creating a safe place to experience the pain, a soft room, and avoiding statements like, carry on, chin up, and you're doing well. Again, remembering the person who has died. Because our job becomes moving the person our relationship with the person from the relationship with the living person to the relationship with that person's memory. And in doing that, we often look for linking objects. I remember working with an organization where one of the key executives died, and this man was loved by his employees. They thought he was wonderful. And upon his death, nobody wanted to occupy his office. And so for six months, the office was left exactly as he had left it. And when the staff finally decided they could make use of the office again, rather than have the executive of the organization offer the office to another executive member, the organization brought the staff together and had them decide amongst all of the people involved in the organization who would be offered the, the office. 
When I heard that, I thought that was pretty wonderful. And the man had an ornament on his desk that everybody was aware of. A part of the contract with taking on the office was that the ornament had to remain in the office. That was many years ago that I did the work with that organization. And to my knowledge, that object, that linking object, that, that piece of that man and his contribution to the corporation is still there. And it doesn't matter how large the organization is. With every person who dies, the organization develops a new identity. And that identity is crafted because of changes in social relationships, financial costs, recreational events, and others. And of course, everybody goes on a search for meaning, and I believe that that also includes the corporation. It involves, of course, spiritual challenges, the big one being, how could God let this happen? The corporation also plays a major role in receiving or providing ongoing support from others because this is a major influence on our capacity to heal. And it also draws on the experience of others. One of the effects of receiving ongoing support from others is often the person who is experiencing grief and loss will note who is supportive and who isn't. And and so it becomes a situation of who's in and who's out, and social relationships are often altered as a result of whether or not the person is supportive. One of the corporate things that I believe in is that corporations must be allowed to encourage the mourning and grieving of a death of an individual for many years after the death. I was called to an incident up in northern Alberta many years ago where a man who was greatly loved by the community that he worked with had died. He was an older man, but the corporation didn't know that because he had concealed his age. He had also concealed his his diagnosis, that being that he had terminal cancer. And so they took his hard hat and they mounted it in a museum case and put it in the area that he worked. That was about eight years ago. I happened to be back on that site a year ago, and that monument still existed for him. I know for him, that corporation held three memorials, one immediately after his death, one on the first year anniversary and one on the second year anniversary, and they were all attended by the majority of staff. And of course, we have to reconcile our grief we have to remember that we don't get over it, and this is important within corporate policy. We have to remember that it will challenge all aspects of our corporate organization. One of the things that I like to remind executives is that when there's a death within the organization, there are a number of things that are important. One is the organization, the staff are watching the management and the management's policy to see what it is they're going to do in support of the family of the individual who has died because they are wondering what would happen to their family if that was them. The other thing is that in many cases these days our workplaces 
full of younger people, many of whom have never experienced a loss, a death, because in current society, because of the advances of medical care, we often don't experience a loss until we're in our 40s. And so they don't know what to do. So having information available or referring them to an organization that has information about what to do, send gifts of food, send flowers, those sorts of things, attend the funeral, all of those things are important. And they need to be explained to individuals who haven't experienced loss before. One of the things that we all have to do is reconcile our grief. And, and I, I've said this earlier, and I'll say it again. We do not get over our grief. We just improve our ability to cope with it. Ellen Wolfelt mentions grief bursts when he speaks about grief and loss. And I think that we have to prepare not only ourselves, but our staff, those people in the workplace, for grief bursts. He talks about walking through Safeway and because he and his father used to make spaghetti with tomato sauce, finding himself in the tomato sauce aisle and looking up and all of a sudden becoming overwhelmed with feelings of grief and loss because of the death of his father, who was no longer there to make spaghetti and tomato sauce. In the workplace, that can have a very similar effect where you can be walking down the hall and all of a sudden something will trig your memory. Perhaps it's the sound of a piece of music on a radio or, or perhaps it's an expression that somebody uses in an adjoining office and you drop back into grief and loss as though the grief were real today. And we need to be ready for those and make sure that our staff are as well. And so as we look at grief and loss, there are some things that we have to recognize. There's no orderly path through grief, no stages. Reconciliation involves learning to live with grief because it involves us being changed forever. And as we say that, because we've changed, the workplace has changed. Grief changes us. And the death becomes a part of the fabric of the workplace. We also should be looking for growth. As many people emerge from grief as stronger and more capable individuals, One of the areas that we also have to be concerned about, of course, is disenfranchised grief. Those areas that don't allow grief or grieving. And so when we talk about grief, disenfranchised grief, what we're really talking about is grief that is not condoned by society, by virtue of social position or stigma or whatever. And it includes uh, grief and loss when we lose somebody because of AIDS or a gay relationship. Or when we see grief and loss being experienced by doctors or nurses or other healthcare professionals who are supposed to be immune to grief. And so now we get down to how can we be of help? Well, we've gone over many of these before. The first one ask how you can help. Get comfortable. Acknowledge grief at work. Pay attention. Be present. Look for clues as to whether your help will be welcome. Don't wait for a sign to offer help. Attend the funeral. 
This is a real demonstration of support of the family. Help with details, pragmatic help, make phone calls, coordinate travel, establish a memorial fund, galvanize workplace support. One of the things that I find very important is using the name of the person who has died. Send flowers. Sending flowers, I think, is really important, even when the obituary says, in lieu of flowers, send donations. Send flowers anyway. They're a statement of love and respect. There are a number of other things that one can do. Plant a grief garden. Establish a memorial fund in the name of the person who has died. Tree planting. Coordinate workplace support. Look at others for signs of self-destruction, abuse of drugs and alcohol. Learn how you can be supportive as you ensure that those people receive appropriate help. Brighten up the environment of people who are grieving. Try changing the color scheme. Adding plants to the environment. If your corporation allows it, you can donate a vacation day to the person who is grieving. Offer it to extend that individual's paid leave. Think of things that will allow you to join together. Anything that allows co-workers to join together as grief often isolates us. One of the things that might join us together is support of a cause. And for those of us who have done a lot of grief work, remember the cliches. Don't fall back on cliches. They diminish the mourner's feelings. Cliches like, I know how you feel. Well, that's not true. We don't know how people feel. It was God's will. Give it time. You must need to keep busy. Now she's in a better place. I really dislike that one. Be strong. At least he did not suffer. This one really grabs at me too. It is time to move on. Try not to think about it. Be glad you had her for as long as you did. Those cause me real concern. Rather, say these, I'm so sorry. I'm thinking of you. Lots of people here care about you. I'm here for you. I'm a good listener. I want to help. I think of you and pray for you every day. As you go through your own grief and loss for the individual, you could wear a symbol of support when there's a death in the workplace. Many workplaces these days will adopt a ribbon as a death symbol. Or if it happens to be a, a death because of impaired driving, <clears throat> MAD often has ribbons available. We come back to the tuna casseroles. Make a meal for the family and for other grievers. Visit the cemetery or the scattering site. Pass around a memorial book. One of the favorite activities of many of the organizations is to create a scrapbook and storybook about the person who has died because the family didn't know what he or she did at work and would view that as a 
keepsake that would be important not only to the current family, but to generations to come. Plan a corporate-wide in-service on grief. As we move to help, remember that the person who is grieving needs time for contemplation, so try and make sure that they have that time to themselves. Try not to talk about similar deaths. They're not helpful. Remember the mourner during holidays. Christmas, Father's Day, Mother's Day, etc. Listen without judging. Understand why listening can be difficult. We have not been taught how to grieve. And listening may trigger our own pain. Follow up and follow through. If you have promised something, see that it's done. And give yourself a hand. Being with those who are experiencing grief and loss is hard work and demands that you look after yourself. Because all of grief is traumatic, a discussion of traumatic grief is in order. In dealing with a traumatic grief situation, recognize that you must reach out for support. If you haven't had training in traumatic grief, here are some key points. It's often difficult to acknowledge and absorb the circumstances of the death. Often they will create a psychic injury frightening and intrusive thoughts. Know about post-traumatic stress symptoms or occupational stress injury, especially if you're working with first responders. And if you are working with first responders, learn about their culture. They are not experiencing loss in a form that most of us are familiar with. They have multiple exposures where most of us deal with exposures on the basis of one or two. We must remember that we have to cope with the traumatic symptoms before we can address grief and loss. Other things that we can do to help create a morning room, what I've called a soft room in my discussion before, create a memorial wall. That memorial wall can be the focus of our memorial service. Plan a ceremony. When man does not know what to do, we invoke ritual. And that ceremony is a ritual. Hold an annual event in memory of the person who has died. And so that's been my discussion of grief and loss in the workplace. I hope it's been helpful to you. If you have questions of me, please email me. McEwen, M-C-E-W-E-N, at highlander-counselingwith2ls.com. And I'll be pleased to respond to you. One of the professionals that has provided a lot of the training and insight that I've received in working in this area has been Alan Wolfelt. And I encourage you to take a look at his publications and publications from the Center for Loss on the web. I hope that this brief recording has been of help to you and that you'll stay tuned as I Anticipate Virginia will be back with me to discuss the importance of funerals in our next installment. Thank you.